welcome to The Digital Patient, where we discuss the latest advancements in digital patient engagement and share stories from the front lines. I'm your host, Alan Sardana, and with me as always is Seamless MD CEO, Dr. Joshua Liu. Today, we're joined by our very special guest, Todd Dunn. Todd is an innovator and entrepreneur who has focused on innovation for more than 10 years. He's worked at notable organizations such as Cisco, Simmons, McKesson, GE, and Intermountain Healthcare. He has educated hundreds of teams in the practical application of innovation theory, methods, and tools to improve innovation outcomes and impact for consumers and companies alike. Todd is currently the Vice President of Innovation for Atrium Health. His work and viewpoints has been featured in Fortune Magazine, U.S. News and World Report, Becker's Hospital Review, Information Week, Healthcare IT News, and Steve Blank Entrepreneur Blog, and through keynote addresses uh, for a number of organizations. His work is also highlighted in Clayton Christensen's book, Competing Against Luck. Todd grew up in Southern Georgia and loves the South. He's married to Wendy and they have three amazing kids, Oliver, Emma, and Ross. Todd received his undergraduate degree in marketing from the University of Utah and his MBA from Michigan State University. Todd, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's amazing to have you on, truly. You've led such a fascinatingly unique career. Uh, it wasn't necessarily mentioned in the bio, but you started in mm -hmm. marketing, you shifted gears to operations with a focus mm -hmm. on supply chain, you carved out your own unique path into the world of innovation, and in particular, healthcare mm -hmm. innovation. And mm -hmm. honestly, Todd, what I really love about your work is how you've emphasized the importance of breaking things down into systems and processes mm -hmm. that make innovation, which I think I even naively held this opinion where it was in the clouds, sometimes intangible work, but you've really made it tangible and uh, evidence-based, repeatable, teachable. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really curious if you can take us back to before you were in this professional responsibility of innovation, who yeah. or what were some of the major influences in your life that really guided you to this vocation? Wow, it's a great question. I'll tell you one instance that really triggered me. There was an article that Clay and Scott Cook and Taddy Hall wrote back in 2005 called Marketing Malpractice. It really got me thinking. Fast forward a few years, I had been um, chosen to lead operations for a software division of McKesson. And because I finished high school in Louisiana, I was invited to go down and meet with a uh, CIO at Opelousas General. His name is Jared Lordman. And Jared took me to this wonderful lunch at a great restaurant called Prejean's in Opelousas, Louisiana. And we sat down over this great meal and Jared just looked at me and Jared probably doesn't remember this story. He looked right at me and he said, Todd, you know, you make my life hell. Okay. It's a very uncomfortable situation. Jared, would you please explain it? And what he articulated was the fact that we demoed a great product, but that his users hated it. And that really bothered me. And so I started doing a lot of just reading and through fortune, if we had longer, I'd tell you the whole story. I got introduced to a dear friend of mine now, a guy named Roy Rosen, who was at Intuit. He helped start the Design for Delight program. We met up for a dinner in San Francisco and there it just kind of started running. And he said, Todd, we talked about Clay. I'd read Clay's work. He knew Clay. Clay had a, a big influence on Intuit, was good friends with Scott. And he said, there's this other guy that I think you would enjoy reading. His name is Steve Blank. And this is back in early 2009. And those people really started shaping the way that I think about the world. And um made me think about maybe the inputs into the operating engine are wrong. Maybe what we believe about what people want from a product is wrong or insufficient. So how do I start thinking about this differently? And that really created the spark for me. And I guess eventually you transitioned into healthcare first in industry and eventually into the provider space. Was yeah. that accidental or how did you end up in, in healthcare? That's a great question. I was working for GE and I led an operations division and we were building an electronic medical record within a mountain healthcare. And I heard through the grapevine that Beth Comstock, the chief marketing officer of GE was creating this innovation thing. And so I emailed Beth and I said, Beth, I'm a big fan. I've read all of Clay's work. I follow Steve Blank. 
I'm raising my hand. I would like to be part of this. She emails me back and said, I don't have open positions, but if you want to volunteer on behalf of GE Healthcare, then I'll welcome you in. And so that kind of kick-started it. I was invited into it. We had Eric Reese there, Kareem Lakhani from Harvard, just a bunch of wonderful people come in and help us start thinking about what eventually became GE Fastworks. And I fell in love with it. I voraciously read all of Steve's work and started learning from Eric. And along the way, I was introduced to Alex Osterwalder's work. We walk into a room at G headquarters and there's this book called Business Model Generation. And it was the oddest looking book. It was landscape and all these different pictures and paintings and concepts. And it hit me. I thought, okay, I really love this. And to your earlier question, being an operator, you think about systems and making decisions and allocating time and money. And I never felt that innovation had been thought about that way. And so I was at GE, that happened. We I sat in a building at Intermountain Healthcare, literally the two people next to me were Intermountain employees because we were working on this project together. When we spun a division out of GE to merge it with one from Microsoft, um, the CIO there, approached me and said, hey, why don't you come do that innovation thing for us that you're doing for GE? And I thought, oh man, I would love to because I wanted to be on the provider side. I'd always been trying to sell into it or build something for it. And that was the transition. Mark Probst and uh, Dr. Stan Huff from Intermountain Healthcare are the ones that invited me in. I mean, actually, Todd, can I ask you, like when, when I hear about innovation leaders at, at healthcare mm -hmm. systems and mm -hmm. what you actually do can, can range. So at some places it could be as limited as, you know, we vet any new innovative technologies all the way to yeah. care redesign, all the way to maybe business model redesign, especially now that maybe you're competing with a lot more consumer facing companies like Amazon and, yep. and whatnot. How do you think about your role in innovation at Atrium today? I think one of the weaknesses in healthcare innovation is we don't think about it as a system. And I'm not being critical of the fact that we need to review and filter startups. I have met with a lot of them. The problem is, I think, or the weakness in the way we fundamentally think about it is we don't think about it as a system. It's the one thing I really took away from GE. There were six people, seven people in Beth's team responsible for designing FastWorks and deploying that language tools and methods around the world. And it worked. Look what they did with Workout and Six Sigma. Look what Intuit has done with Design for Delight, now customer obsession. Look at what IKEA has done with Life at Home. They put P&G. They're arguably really started the great consumer work and the discipline around it. And so I feel my job now is to help the company implement an innovation system to where leaders can renovate their own business models or create new ones. They can find efficiencies versus always trying to have this small team that pops around and lights little fires. I think people are very capable when you put a system in place. And that's my job here is to help put that system in place. We still get involved in projects that need kind of deep expertise around business models and the jobs theory. The main way to bend the curve, I think, is to create a capability of innovation, not just capacity within a team. That's amazing. So it's, it's kind of like if you can put a system in place, then whether Todd's there or way past your time at Atrium, that system will exist. It'll keep running. You're not dependent on you forever. That's right. Amazing. Well, I love said. that. And one of these systems, Todd, uh, you recently co-authored a paper in Digital Mag or Digital mm -hmm. Medicine magazine mm -hmm. uh, on deploying digital health tools within large, complex health systems. And what yeah. you really did is you break you break down in the article the key considerations for adoption and implementation. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's one segment of these systems that you've put in place, but could you unpack some of these main ideas for our audience? Yeah, I wish I could show it. Actually, when I was at Intermountain Healthcare, one of the things that we were really trying to figure out what to do is move innovation from this interesting activity over there to something that left a lasting impact in the context that we were serving. And so I have to give great credit to Billy Prowse, Corey Smith, Matt Scott, guys who were on my team. And we sat down one day and said, if we're going to do this, how would we do it? And so we started with a checklist that said, okay, how well do you understand the consumer problem in the context of the problem? 
How well do you understand the business model around the consumer in their context? How well do you understand the company's business model problem? So we started going through this relentless checklist to basically say, you've got to build an alliance around the consumer, the customer, and the company problem. How do you do that? So we would teach observations, we would teach business modeling, we teach the job theory. The reason that we did that is so there would be really a handbook so you could duplicate successes over and over again or stop failure sooner. And that's really the concept of the paper. One of the co-authors, Dr. Gabriel Bratt and I worked together on a project with a company called Tissue Analytics. Mm -hmm. And we went all the way from doing observations in a wound clinic in St. George, Utah, and with um, some wonderful doctors and nurses to deploying a wound measurement and management system across the entire enterprise from inpatient to the clinic to home care. So that was the genesis of it is to say, there's a handbook, you can do this. There's a science to and method to innovation. You just don't have to be this really brilliant guy in a black turtleneck. <laughs> Amazing. We actually, uh, we talked to Dr. Uh, recently and I, I think he's coming on the pod soon. So, uh, yeah. We'll wonderful, well. wonderful person. Amazing yeah. doctor. Yeah. Todd, I gotta say, um, you know, I was doing a little bit of research on you and mm. I found this one quote that you said, I really love this quote. It's if you mm. don't have an innovation system, you're mm -hmm. basically just embracing the status quo. Uh, I, I'm sure you went on past that quote to explain uh, you know, why you've arrived at that. But, um, you know, you've also shared just in the past how innovation is historically a job of the few. But mm -hmm. what you're saying already in this conversation is it really needs to be a responsibility and a capability of the many. Yeah. Can you unpack that for us? Yeah. I, I think if you... Success is a race to some degree. Um for corporations, everyone is rushing, if you will, racing for the lack of a better term to win the customer or the consumer. And if you embrace the status quo, somebody else isn't. And you've kind of accepted your fate. And that drives me crazy. It drives me crazy on a few levels. It's just like when you know, Jared said I made his life hell. I think we have a moral obligation that if consumers are giving us their time and money, we must return something that they see as valuable and valuable for a long time to them for the time and money that they give us. It just seems to, that's like the root of why you need to innovate. And a job of the few versus a capability of the many. Um, when I've looked at projects in the past, we could do a tissue project or a wound project and it could affect a, a piece of the company. But what I deeply believe is that people closest to the work know it best. They fundamentally understand their struggles. What maybe they don't have are the tools and languages to articulate that. So if you were to go in an executive room today, let's say you have a hundred people and you were to have them all write down their definition of business model, turn it in. And one of you are going to read every definition that's written on a note, you know, just a little note. Not two of them would be the same. That tells me you don't have a capability of the many to innovate around their business models. The reason that I believe that's important is because if you build out that capability within the leadership ranks, of an organization in the system with the language tools and methods, then your company is innovating on so many fronts that you're moving it forward past the status quo, not just in an area or two, but in the entire entity. And that want to me, that's why that is so important is just like finance understanding as a capability, et cetera. If you don't see it as a system, it's really hard to scale that within the leadership ranks. And in all candor, they're all told to innovate and do new things anyway, but without the system of the language tools and methods, how do you make that happen? So you owe it back to the leaders who are under pressure to do that, to give them a system that makes it easier for them to do it. I, I, I've seen teams where there are some people who just naturally like love the, the idea of innovation and, and solving problems in new ways. And then there's others on the team sometimes who will say, well, Todd, 
that mm -hmm. wasn't on my job description when I signed up. Like, why mm -hmm. do I have to do this new thing that I wasn't, you know, expected to do when I first started here? Mm -hmm. Um, how do you sort of coach people through sort of changing their mindset on not only just doing what was on the list when they first came? Because you can't innovate as an organization if everyone's doing what they were, you know, had in their job description five years ago. Um, a coach doesn't exist without a student, mm -hmm. without a player. I have kids who are really good athletes. And the fact that they are, they want to learn and do makes the coach the coach when you find resistance I, I learned this notion from michael watkins he wrote the first 90 days master your next move wonderful person brilliant thinker and master your next move michael talks about the notion of relationships and alliances and the fact that an alliance happens when we both find a problem to solve that if we both contribute to it, it lifts all boats. And so when you find resistance, my opinion is, is the key is you empathetically ask questions about what they're struggling with. Everybody at some level has friction in their day, either as a leader or at the process level, they have friction. And so I think as innovators, we have to empathetically go in. And if there's resistance, we have to really hover in and find out what's causing and it could be the fact that their schedules are so relentless and we have way too many things on their plate that maybe where we need to start is removing something small to create space in their day in their mind to innovate in a new way so i think resistance is usually not because they don't want to get better it's because they don't see the way of having the time to do it and so i just don't see resistance as real resistance i just see it as I'm so overwhelmed. I have no idea how I'm going to fit this in. And that I think is an indicator that you need to look at efficiency innovation as a lever to work on with people. And I guess sometimes that means letting your team know, Hey, it's okay for you to drop some of these balls that you were juggling. They're not as important anymore. <laughs> it's interesting. You bring that up. I priorities. Mm -hmm. It's making decisions on what you're going to focus on which inherently also says what you're not is super important and it's the only way i believe to deliver value over and over and over again you know this whole notion of we're getting so fractionated if that's a word that it's okay to tell your team let's just pick the five key things or whatever they are and do those once you do those you'll start creating space to add one will go off, the fifth one will come in. Innovation is, it, it takes a long time. It takes forever. Intuit officially started Design for Delight in, what, 2007? Yes. I think they changed it to Customer Obsession in 2019 or 20. Hmm. And so you have to have a long view of this to, I think, make an innovation system stick and become part of the fabric of how you think and behave. Todd, can I ask you, like, because you've done innovation now on the industry side and now on the provider side, have yeah. you noticed any unique barriers um, or dynamics <laughs> on the provider side when it comes to driving innovation that you didn't see when you were in industry? Yeah. It goes back to your last question. Uh, the ability to, not the ability, prioritization, mm -hmm. meaning I often say the hardest word in healthcare is no. Mm -hmm. Our hearts, I think, because we're, I, I say empathy is the heartbeat of healthcare, and inherently that's a beautiful gift, and inherently that's a problem, because we don't want to say no to anything. It, almost any idea, I think we could extract it down to helping an individual, and because of that, our hearts are drawn to want to do that. In big corporations, I felt it was easier just to say no. We don't have the money or the budget, so we're going to do that. Well, we're the same. We don't really have, we certainly don't have the money that some of the industry partners have, but yet we have this issue in our hearts that saying no is super hard. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's more about prioritizing the ones that you can have really good impact on, but that's the barriers that the, the heart to say no and the reasoning and the systems for saying no that make it easier or will make it easier within a provider system to prioritize your innovation work.
I think that's been one of the challenges I've noticed too, like meeting a lot of different healthcare startups, you know, in, in, an, in another industry, if you don't make money or, or save money, you, you know, it's obvious that it won't take off in the industry, but in healthcare, there are a lot of solutions that maybe don't make money, don't save money, but actually improve patient outcomes. And they don't understand why they're not getting adoption in the system because mm -hmm. unfortunately just helping patients, helping providers isn't enough to get adoption at scale. And, and that's, and that's sometimes hard for us, I think, to understand on a human level because we care so much about, about good health. Mm -hmm. We do. That's a great point. I, in, within a business model, you really have three legs of that stool, if you will. I could argue maybe the fourth one, desirability, feasibility, viability. And the way that I think about desirability is what progress are they trying to make and is what you're offering acceptable to them to make the progress. The feasibility part is, can we do it? You know, you got key activities you got to do. You need resources. You need partners to do that. Often the answer there is yes. Because if you get creative with partners, and you can solve a lot of problems. However, is it the right way to solve it is the question. Is that a desirable way to solve it? And then you get this inner, it's just interconnected with viability. Can you afford to do it? Mm -hmm. And I think health systems are getting wiser in balancing desirability, feasibility, viability versus just the desirability part. Because our hearts run so hard and fast there. But, and that's where the system comes in. When you look at, you're a doctor, when you look at, we follow protocols, clinical process models, we diagnose before we prescribe, we literally use a scientific method over and over again. We have historically used theory, germ theory, cell theory. So when you look at what's inherent and what's made medicine progress so well over the last hundred years or so, those are the fundamentals that we also need to embrace and interject into an innovation system. And once you have that language of explaining why innovation needs to work that way, I have found personally that the provider system is more open to seeing that rigor around mm -hmm. innovation. No longer do you celebrate the brilliance. You harness the brilliance through a system and celebrate the impact. Can I ask you, and, and sorry, I'm going off way off schedule, but you're just such a, a brilliant. I'm just, I'm person. following you, man. You're good. You can ask anything you want. I appreciate it. I, I'm curious. So, you know, at Atrium, you know, you're over 40 hospitals and I'm curious how you think about leading innovation of a system at that size versus let's say you're working at a, a single hospital organization. Like what are you doing differently at, at this scale of 40 hospitals to build an innovation system that you wouldn't have to do maybe in a, in a one hospital system? In a one hospital system, you can almost muscle yourself with a small innovation team. Here you can't. So as an example, we have a leadership institute here. And my dear HR friend and leader, Jim Dunn, and one of his direct reports, Daniel Gondaria, and I started talking about this aspiration I had to create an innovation impact academy where we teach the language tools and methods of innovation to leaders. And we've recently started that. It's part of our leadership institute, but it's an innovation track. You would never have to do that type of lifting and content development and different media options of learning in maybe one hospital as compared to doing it across multiple states. That's a really distinct difference. Probably easier to prioritize at a smaller system because in a bigger system, you just have so many additional things coming at you. And you often maybe have more um, people or a little bit more money to do that. So it's just the magnitude of the problem is very different. And it requires me and the team and I to sit back and say, okay, how would we leverage and scale what we know mm -hmm. versus having to go do all the projects? How would we build the capability? Not have to think about that as much at a smaller system. You still have to think about it, but the magnitude right. over here is exponentially different. Right. It, it kind of reminds me how I think at some some companies, when you're small, you don't really have to create internal, let's call it academies or certification for different mm -hmm. roles. But at scale, like I said, into it, you, you were mentioning a lot before, they probably have, you know, really like a sales university internally for the sales team mm -hmm. or, or similar for other roles. Yeah, they had... Um, 
yeah there's uh ben blank is the guy who leads it for into it and he has an entire catalyst system mm-hmm. where people are taught how to do observations they're taught how to run experiments identify assumptions and test those through experimentation yeah they have a system and they've had a system for a very long time mm-hmm. wow there's a reason they're winning it's not just because they're smarter or whatever i think people are smart everywhere as they figured out a system to harness the brilliance to delight a consumer. I love that. Um, Todd, another thing that I wanted to talk about, one of your mentors was the late great Clayton Christensen who developed the theory of disruptive innovation among tons of other theories. Uh, One of the most influential business ideas was that disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious so I did. I have actually read his book, Competing Against Luck, mm. and I know that you're featured in. I think it was chapter four. Uh, yeah. I didn't. I didn't know you at the time, so that was. It was really cool to discover that. Mm. But uh, I'm really curious. How did you first meet Clay? And you know, how and when did that happen? Um, 2010. I was reading his work. I'd revisited marketing malpractice so many times, and. I'd gotten to know Roy really well. I I called Clay's office mm-hmm. at Harvard. And fortunately, I had gotten to know his brother-in-law, but that's not really how I got to meet him. I just called his office and um, I said, look, you don't know me, but I work for GE. I'm becoming part of this innovation effort here. And I just want to talk to Clay. Mm-hmm. You think you'd be kind enough to share 30 minutes with me? And his assistant said, I think he would. I'll get back with you. And so she did. She got back with me and there we go. Wow. Turned into, uh, yeah, good, an amazing man. Very generous, yeah. Oh, yeah, very generous. I, I So I, I do want to highlight this this one chapter in his book, mm-hmm. Competing Against Luck. Um, mm-hmm. There's a story where it basically is illustrating or highlighting one of your light bulb moments that you had. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to uh, tell yeah. the story, but could you yeah. share that story for us? And <laughs> yeah, I, um, I, I had a meniscus tear in my knee. I didn't know it at time, and so I called my buddy Mike Holmstrom, who was part of the orthopedic specialty hospital, Intermountain Healthcare. I said, "Hey, man, they should look at my knee." And so I showed up at Tosh went into the room and it's a typical room. There's that bed with that horrible white paper on it. And so I decided to sit in the chair and you could probably guess why I didn't, and I didn't sit on the paper. I hate sitting on the paper. It just really made me uncomfortable. And so I sat in the chair, Mike comes in and I'm sitting in the chair and Mike, rolls right up in front of me. He didn't make me get up on the bed, which I thought was awesome. And he brings up my x-ray or whatever up on the wall, but he didn't use it. And I said, hey, Mike, because I got the language of the job series. Like, hey, why didn't you hire the, you know, the images to explain my need to me? And this is when the light bulb really hit me. As he said, Todd, because he was drawing it. I mean, literally, he took out a piece of paper. I still have it, by the way. And he drew my knee and he said, if I sit knee to knee with you, I can tell if you understand what I'm explaining to you. And there it hit me. It was an emotional job for him. If he wanted to make sure he was engaged with me and that I understood. The paper was just the functional hire to draw the image. And he said, also, you know, if we're standing up, we're shoulder to shoulder and I can't read you very well. I said, okay. And then I said, yeah, but you're supposed to be typing in the record. We were just, (laughs) and um, we were just moving to Cerner. And he said, "Uh uh-uh, not going to do that. And I said, Mike, you're supposed to do that. And he said, okay, Todd. And so what he did, he spun around, literally, (laughs) and rolled away. And he said, I don't want to be known as a doctor who turns his back on his patient just to type in a computer. And if you know the job theory, there's the functional, social, and emotional dimensions of progress. Well, that was his social one. I don't want to be known as a doctor who turns his back on his patient. And as I was experiencing that through the lens of my of the job theory, but 
I was at the doctor, man, the light bulb went on. It really went on because I saw all of the dimensions in that 10, 15 minutes I had with Mike. And so I emailed Clay and I said, Clay, light bulb went on. I've, I, I just got to tell you the story. So I typed the story out. Funny thing is Mike Holmstrom had taken a class from Clay before. And so I sent Clay and Clay call, Clay sends back. He says, Todd, you have got to meet Karen Dillon and Taddy Hall where David Duncan were working on a book. And that's where the journey of competing against luck happened is because I just wanted to share with Clay that the theory applies in the real world. And it opened my eyes to the fact that we need to see people as multidimensional, functional, social, emotional. And if we could design to all of those elements, we can design products that they would love to use, frankly. That's story, yeah. It's a fond memory, to say the least. I love that. That's so cool. Um, I'm also curious. So, you know, you've you've also shared this on other podcasts. Uh, mm. One particular system that's centered around customer sprints, and mm. you've sort of talked about it so far. But I, yeah. I really want to get into the weeds of that. What is a customer sprint in your eyes, and how do you leverage them to really understand the customer and the consumer at a, a deep level? I have this thing I call the three C's of design disease: conference calls, conf- uh, conference calls cubes and conference rooms and people don't live work learn play or pray there so to me the most important element of a customer sprint is going to their context Mm -hmm. clay and a guy named bob Mesta often reminded us circumstance is the essential unit of innovation so the first part of the sprint right out of the gate we need to go to where the consumer or the customer actually experiences what they're struggling with versus ask them to get on a call and explain it to us or come to a conference room. Now, is there usefulness in doing those interviews? Yes, but I don't think they're useful in doing scripted interviews. Mm -hmm. I think you need to start with a research question. What are you struggling with in the context that you're Mm -hmm. working in? And then do everything you can to build a documentary of the person in their life. I really do prefer going and doing observations. That's not always practical. And so you still have to go with that idea that you're filming a movie and their questions are to tease out every aspect of the movie that you can. That's to me, the most important sprint is to make sure you get an understanding of their world and how they're experiencing their world and what are the friction points or the things that they really hope to accomplish that they can't. That to me is the most important of the design of anything. Because if you miss that, you probably aren't going to have a good business either. Right. And uh, you had a term before painstorming, before brainstorming. And <laughs> yeah. I, I love that one. What is yeah. painstorming just for folks who might not know? It's literally giving your consumer and the interaction that you have with them, all of the safety that they need to tell you all the friction points that they have. Mm-hmm. It's literally trying to get every little bit of friction out of their day. Because what often happens is we get in these brainstorming sessions. And then the fundamental question remains, well, what's that going to fix? Mm-hmm. Like, how do we know? And so if you start with the diagnosis, to me, the diagnosis is painstorming whether you're learning that through a really good way to interview or if you're learning that through doing observations, you're painstorming. You're really trying to find out the most dynamic problems that they want solved and when. Then you go brainstorm because then the brainstorming is pointed towards something that the consumer really wants you to solve for versus just the guesswork. It's literally painstorming to me as the diagnosis. Mm-hmm. It is the diagnosis. Brainstorming is the notion of prescribing. Right. Oh, I love that. And then uh, another, I'm just throwing out terms that very good. <laughs> that very good. Uh, another one was uh, question bursts and assumption bursts. Oh, yeah. Um, the question burst really is what's everything we're curious about? Mm-hmm. I think empathy and curiosity are the two fundamental keys of great innovators and in innovation. And so if you get people to do question burst, you put them in the mode of curiosity versus the mode of knowing. Mm -hmm. And I think that puts you on a journey of empathy of wanting to know more. What are you curious about? And then you just write down all the questions that you possibly can. 
The other issue, though, that we often run into innovation is people have they've mistaken that beliefs are facts or mm -hmm. evidence. Mm -hmm. And so go back to the idea of medicine. We we draw blood to run labs right, to, so that we can really understand with an assumption burst. What we do is take Alex's canvas and we literally do assumption burst in a statement like the scientific method. We believe that hmm. the nurse will want to do X. To test that, we are going to do Y, and we are right or wrong with Z. And so one of the reasons that I like to do assumption bursts is to get people comfortable admitting that they don't have all the evidence that they need before they make a big investment of time or money. And it's also still inherent in medicine. It's your scientific method. You get your assumptions, you put them in a two by two matrix and you decide the ones that you can test and learn quickly that could be the whole hang up. You know, the thing that Eric talked mm -hmm. about, the leap of faith assumption, the thing that has to hold true. So that's why I like a question burst. It keeps you curious. Assumption burst keeps you safe. Mm -hmm. It designs your path of experiments and that de-risk you. And in a business of really tiny margins like us, we ought to just harness what the system already knows, and that's a scientific method. Mm -hmm. To some yeah. degree, it's the ruling out logic. You know, we're trying to rule out everything that won't work mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that when we actually prescribe, we're doing the right procedure, we're doing the right whatever we're doing. It's the same fundamental principle just pulled into innovation. Now, can I ask you about how you think about building a, a culture of curiosity? So for example, I think sometimes mm -hmm. like for folks who are new to it, we might give them a list of like, here are the five questions that you should have, you should talk about <laughs> or ask in a, in a customer discovery meeting or something like that. But really what we want are for folks to develop their own intellectual curiosity. So that way they can go off script when it makes sense. Yeah. Um, any exercises or best practice for cultivating intellectual curiosity in teams? Yes. Get the leader to ask questions. Hmm. Procter and Gamble has this practice in their innovation work to where the leaders ask questions about the consumer in every meeting. And I think that that is a fundamental leadership behavior. I think the higher you go up the chain, the more questions you need versus the answers. Mm -hmm. And so that one practice I would argue will start to foster curiosity in the organization. And then just think of your own questions. What are you unsure of? What have you? I collect questions, which is a little bit of an odd thing I know, but I always ask questions in a lot of meetings. And so if leaders will just ask a lot of questions and just set aside time, what are you curious about? What do we need to know before we invest more time or money? Why do current solutions fail to delight the user? Mm -hmm. If you just ask a couple of thought provoking questions and then give the space and time to let people come up with an answer and then just keep asking mm -hmm. questions, the behavior will start to replicate itself pretty quickly. It's a psychological safety thing. You know, you think mm -hmm. about Amy Edmondson's work. I think she's right. Mm -hmm. Create a safe space for doing that. People will start doing it more often. Right. I love kind that. of in, in line with that, Todd, um, you've talked uh, before about the hippo syndrome or the highest paid person <laughs> opinion in the room. Yeah. How, do, how do you, you one, one to two steps, how do you eliminate that from happening? Well, you could choose culturally that you don't let your hippo stay in your organization very long, <laughs> or you could also put a system in place that negates the hippo. Hmm. So if we all get violent agreement on this is how we're going to innovate, we're going to do observations, we're going to look at the world through the jobs to be done lens, we're going to document it, we're going to run experiments around the, the assumed behaviors of the consumer, we're going to use the business model canvas. If you can get agreement to the system, then for the most part, you will eliminate this notion of hierarchical um, titles because you've agreed to the system of evidence that suggests when you should invest more time or money versus someone's opinion. So you got to keep going back to the system because leaders by their very nature are often rewarded for making decisions. And that's okay. There's probably a time when that's necessary. But when you have someone whose power, it isn't safe to challenge them, then you got to have a system in place from an innovation perspective that they agree to following. Mm -hmm. I think that's, it's a really hard one to overcome, but the system will often negate it. 
I feel like at this point you need like a system for your systems. Like even just to honestly the, to put the systems in place, you have a system on on how to do that. That's uh, the alliance. That's the alliances. You know, identifying the fact that innovation is a it's a must have. It's an imperative. If you don't mm-hmm. do it, somebody else is doing it. <laughs> so you're going to wind up losing, or you're just not going to wind up performing to the level of the corporation that it needs to or that it can. And once you come to that agreement and understanding, the rest gets easier. But it's this violent agreement alliance early that if you don't have an innovation system in place, your company cannot perform in the way that your employees, your community, your consumer, your customer needs it to. Right. Totally makes sense. Um, Another one of your systems is the design for impact framework. Mm -hmm. And I I love the phrase that you use uh, when you were uh, pitching that framework you were talking about coins in the in the couch and dollars in the dryer <laughs> yeah uh, could you unpack a that phrase for us and then also yeah. illustrate how is that used to encourage innovation yeah um you remember the book by peter sims little bets mm. that's one of my books that it's always just stuck in my mind and if peter somehow listens to this hello peter <laughs> but um he rewarded little bets and so when I first got here, Jim Dunn, I, um, he's our chief people officer, the best one I've ever met. I just uh, words can't describe how, how much I think of who he is. He's an amazing person. He and I were talking one night about efficiency innovation, which is one of the key buckets of innovation. And I said, Jim, all I want to do is put a system in place that rewards people for finding coins in the couch and dollars in the dryer, little bets. Because if we can light little bet fires across 75,000 employees, then we can find time and money to free up time and money to invest in business model innovation because time and money are your scarce things. And that just kind of stuck. Um, It was one of those moments where, just came to my mind is like, how do I explain this to someone? Everyone has found a money in the couch, even as a kid, and you always mm-hmm. remember it. And when I was talking to Jim, he's like, Todd, you know, he's an executor. He said, man, I found two $20 bills in the dryer a couple of weeks ago. And I thought I was rich. <laughs> and I said, see, it's like this finding that money that was wadded up in the pocket and it came out. Okay. Out of the dryer is very rewarding. Mm-hmm. And I think it's very rewarding for employees to have that same type of win. That's where coins in the couch and dollars in the dryer came from, is that it's rewarding people like, yeah, just find the coins, mm-hmm. find the dollars, because it lets them think about the little things. Because a priori, you don't really know if it's going to be big or not. So don't try to aim big. Just go do something, reward the little bets, coins mm-hmm. in the couch, dollars in the dryer. I love that. Yeah, it's kind of funny. People remember it, sure. Yeah, it's got a great ring to it. Yeah, um, check all my pockets now. Yeah. Yeah. We've <laughs> all done it. We've all done it. We'll probably all go home and check our couches tonight or our pockets right. and our jackets or whatever. Yeah, uh, that's great. Uh, Todd, last question that I had, um, Josh may have another, but almost a decade ago, you published an article called The Seven mm-hmm. Deadly Healthcare Startup Sins. Yeah. Uh, and in that article, you're you're sharing basically seven mm-hmm. common reasons why healthcare startups fail. And you also give a lot of practical advice for healthcare startups. Uh, now, it's about eight years later uh, since you, you yeah. penned that article. And the world of digital health has certainly evolved. I'm curious, mm-hmm. would you change anything in your list after all this time? Or do you still notice those same com- common um, sins happening? I think, you know, when I talked about doctors won't go to their own portal, go to your mm-hmm. portal we're starting to see that digital companies are wiser and knowing that they have to integrate into the EMR. So that's probably not as prevalent as it used to be. A um, couple things. I don't say digital health. Mm. I think that's a prescription. I think it's human health. Mm-hmm. And we're trying to understand how to help a human be healthier through the hiring or use of a digital tool. I think that's really important because if you prescribe it already, maybe you're going to miss something. I would offer, I've actually thought about writing this. I was going to offer that to Steve if he'd let me write another one. But yes, I would say startups need to be able to show how their business model helps our business model perform better. Another very specific one, as I would say, is causality versus correlation. Mm -hmm. 
If I move the mouse, the cursor moves. If I hire your product, what moves and how do I prove it? Does it directly help quality go up and I can prove it? Because if you make quality go up, certainly your costs are going to go down. And so that's, I say, really understand our business model and the struggles within it and show how yours affects it. And then make sure you can talk about causal versus correlated so that you can help the health system see their way to the impact that you can prove. Hmm. Yeah, I love that. But by the way, Todd, I will say, I did reread your original list of, of seven <laughs> sins. And to your credit, um, most of these are, in my opinion, still very true. And actually, st- unfortunately, mistakes are still being made. So I think I yeah. hope we can get more retweets of your article because it's still incredibly valuable, you know, seven, eight years later. Uh, it's kind of you. I I just was thinking about it one night because I'd done so much work at Intermountain Healthcare with early stage companies. And I emailed Steve and I said, Steve, I've got this idea. I want to write this article about mistakes that early stage companies are making. And I, I can't remember exactly what I called it initially. It might have been the seven deadly sins or whatever. And yeah, yeah. He, he helped me massage the wording a little bit. And then, you know, for a guy that's as successful and as brilliant as Steve, he was kind enough to let me share my viewpoint of being from within side of a provider. So, mm-hmm. yeah, hats off to him. I still read everything he writes. Amazing. By the way, I think I totally agree with you that um, I hope at some point we don't have to call it telemedicine or virtual oh, care. It's just it's just a tool in the toolbox, you know. It's just a tool in the toolbox. Yeah, we'll get there. We've got to we've got to stay consistent. We got to keep that beat drum beat mm-hmm. of making it an innovation system, mm-hmm. harnessing the scientific method, harnessing theory, harnessing language tools, methods, and letting it become less of this thing over there and more of a system that just helps us get better faster. And we will, we will. I think there are a lot of us crazy enough to keep grinding and digging and, you know, thanks to podcasts that allow us to have these conversations. That's so true. In your in your questions, you asked me, you maybe you're going there about this notion of delighters. Mm-hmm. So we when I worked for McKesson, we wrote requirements documents all the time. And our doctors and nurses, this where I also came up with the three C's of design disease, get other doctors and nurses on conference calls or in rooms and say, Hey, tell us what you want. Well, automatically you just put the burden on that person to tell you how to design your product Mm -hmm. and they don't know how to code. They don't know how to build stuff. Like what an unfair notion (laughs) that a requirements document or practice is. This is Todd's opinion. And I kept watching these requirements documents and then we hand them off to the engineers because for eight months I ran the engineering group at McKesson for Horizon Clinicals. I was an engineer, but there was so much back and forth. I literally don't understand it. And then they were coding this thing. It's like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. And then you, you get Jared saying, you make my life hell. So you start piecing all these puzzles. You get like, what's wrong in the practice mm. of what we're doing? And I was in Switzerland in 2017. Alex had invite us, invited probably 30 of us over to do a master boot camp with him. And um, in Baden. And in the top part of the customer profile, of the value proposition canvas, there's required, expect, desired, and there was another one. So I thought of this acronym, required, expected, desired, delighters. Mm -hmm. And I thought, wait a minute. If we were to say, we're going to build delighter documents, just like Scott Mm -hmm. and Roy and Ben and the team did it into it, designed for delight, What if we didn't talk about requirements documents, but we said, what would delight the consumer? You can't get through the delight door unless you go through the requirements door anyway. Mm -hmm. So flip it. And you would say, what behavior has to be different to discover the delighters? Well, you can't keep asking them the same old questions. Mm -hmm. And so you would go spend more time in their context. You wouldn't go round in a hospital. You would ground in a hospital. You'd stay there for a week, two weeks Mm -hmm. to really learn. That's where the delighter notion came from is in Baden after just watching so many bad products, I was just sitting there thinking, yeah, what would we, 
what would we do differently if we change the way we think about the document? Mm -hmm. It's a delighter document. It has to delight the engineer. Would we let the engineers go do observations? Of course we would. Into it, does it? And look what the, they're winning all mm -hmm. the time. That's what I would do. That's where it came from. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Simple notion, but it really changes the way we think about things. Yeah. It changes behavior. And totally. I think it's once awesome. you implement that, people don't want to go back to the way they were doing things. No way. Because it makes everybody's life better. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it makes you more competitive. It's mm -hmm. like Jeff Bezos said in an 11 second video the number one reason by far that we win is because of our obsessive compulsive focus on the customer as opposed to obsession over the competitor. Mm -hmm. I think a delighter mindset is an obsession on the customer and the consumer. Yeah. I love that. Todd, I could listen to you talk for hours at this point. Man, <laughs> you guys are kind. You guys are doing the work too. We're just all in this dang thing together. And the more conversations we have, the better off we're going to be. I, I totally agree with that. Um, now, just being mindful of your time, let's flip over to what we call the fast five lightning round. Let's roll, man. Okay. Five questions. Let's go. Number okay. one, what is your favorite book or book you've gifted the most? And I know you're a big reader, so that I, I'm sure there's a ton, but. Two books. The one I wrote, We Go Together, it's a kid's book. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite because I created it by singing to my kids when they were little. Oh, that's cute. The other one is Competing Against Luck. Mm -hmm. Partly because it means a lot to me personally, but also it offers a framework for us to really figure out how to delight consumers. And it's a teachable, repeatable framework <laughs> that gives us insights we'd never have before. That's right. Yeah, I love that. Uh, question two, who is a person either dead or alive you'd love to meet? Oh, man. I'd love to see my grandmother again. Mm. Hazel. Wonderful. There are a few. It. I'll be quick. But Harriet Tubman. Mm. Brave, yeah. courageous, all the obstacles that would say not to do it. When I was a kid, I read the Underground Railroad, and I still have in my mind the movie mm -hmm. that I that I when I saw when I was reading. Um, those two, I mean, there are a lot, you know, Sam Adams, all the fire brands that mm -hmm. started the country, but those two mainly, my grandmother and Harriet Tubman. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, question three is a little different. Would you rather have super strength, super speed, or the ability to read people's minds? I'm so damn slow. I'd love to be fast. <laughs> <laughs> My older son is a minor league baseball That's player. Right. He's so fast. And I just would love to know what that feels like once. Uh, that's funny. That's great. Uh, question four, what is something in healthcare you believe that others might find insane? The amount of time we ask clinicians who go to school forever, mm. how much time we ask them to spend with paper versus people. Mm. Yeah. Insane. Unacceptable. That's a great one. Uh, last question that we have, Todd, this is a pandemic related one. What is one hobby or activity you've gotten into since the beginning of the pandemic? I haven't really. Um I'm I'm so immersed with my wife and kids that I don't really have hobbies outside of doing something with them. Of course, I love to read. I did walk my dog a lot mm -hmm. because I was by myself the first number of months of COVID because of the kids' school and baseball schedules. But I didn't really pick up another hobby. I'm kind of a boring guy. I, I love to read. I absolutely have a voracious appetite for learning. I kept that up, probably did that more yeah. than I had done before. Yeah, I, I, I heard an, a story. I think you were talking about it. It was a long time ago, but you wrote down, maybe you were 15, you wrote down like your one foundational trait that you wanted to always be present in your life was learning. It's yeah. kind of insatiable. And then you made it a priority. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Yeah. yeah, it stays there. I think it's um, it's what questions embody for me is the avenue for learning. Clay had this saying, a great question creates space in the brain for new learning to park. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I need to I need to park more things in my brain. So I've got to ask questions. I love that's, that. how you, that's how you learn. Mm -hmm. Todd, one last follow-up question for you. Yes. Um, 
are you are you planning to write another book or mm -hmm. oh. yes i'm actually going to write i'm working on an innovation book now um i'm we've got the chapter structure pretty close to what i would like for it to be karen dillon is just an amazing author and she's wrote she's written a number of things with clay and I, she is just, man, she's so just amazing person. I call her, say, can you just give me advice on how to write a book? <laughs> and she's, what she taught me was really interesting. She said, Todd, think about it from the point of view of the reader. Mm. And what is your point of view that you believe will help them and serve them in something that you're trying to do? And that makes writing harder. Mm -hmm. You always have to put yourself in that, you know, from that dynamic perspective so yeah i'm writing one i don't know when it'll be ready my wife had just asked me last night hey how much are you working on book? <laughs> so we'll see it's getting, yeah, it's awesome. getting closer yeah it sounds like that would be a harder way of writing but definitely more rewarding as well that's yeah. that's amazing we'll have to have you back on a lot uh, of people to thank time. there's so many people to thank i think the forward to my book will be exhausted with the number of people that i have <laughs> That I literally have a debt of gratitude forever. It's um, you have these conversations and you start thinking of all the people that you owe for teaching you something, for asking you something, for giving you a little grace when you were learning. And yeah, it's a cool thing. Like me and you guys, I think about just think about the richness of life around this topic that we get to experience and learn and teach each other. Mm -hmm. Got to keep it going. Yeah. Amazing. Well, we, we certainly have a, a debt of gratitude for having you on the show oh, today. No, man, no, <laughs> this is, it's a round table, buddy. It's just, <laughs> thank you. Amazing. Well, uh, thank you, Todd, and, and everybody listening to the conversation. And you can find Todd on Twitter at T Todd Dunn. Uh, that's T T O D D and then D U N N. Yeah. And that's a wrap for this episode of The Digital Patient, hosted by SeamlessMD. You can follow us on Twitter at SeamlessMD. And if you like the podcast and you want to learn more, you can visit www.seamless.md. Todd, again, thanks so much. Always. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, and happy Thanksgiving to you and thankful for your time and for everyone out there working to make healthcare better for everybody. Mm -hmm.